talk is by uh, Sesh about hashes that beat wedges. So please. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. <clears throat> so uh, thanks to the organizers for, for the invitation. Um, and you know, thanks to all of you for making it on a Friday morning. So this is, uh, this is about a one result. It's a joint work with uh, Anish Sharma, who's now at Google, but he was at Twitter when this happened, and which is sort of central to the story, and with uh, Ashish Goyal at Stanford. So um, just as a, this is based on a true story, uh, meaning that the, the application I talk about is, is actually an application. Like, it really <laughs> did happen. So th that's not always the case with my papers. But <laughs> um, And uh, the, the story is sort of, it's like some big data problem, which actually led to some theory, which actually led to some practice. So it was actually, it's a nice example for me where the whole story was sort of completed. Uh, so maybe it's not something completely different, but it was different for me. So <clears throat> usually as an algorithms person, when I try to work with someone who's applied, you know, I will go, I will talk with them, learn about their problem, think about it for a while, and then say, you know what, I have this amazing algorithm for your problem. It's two times faster than previous work here. I actually coded it up. I have some things. I have some nice theory. And so that's, that's me on the side. Uh, I don't have a hat because I'm not that important and I don't make as much money. And so the applied person will say, well, I just bought a cluster with five times more memory. I don't care. I'm just going to use my old code. And uh, they'll say, you know, I've just I've engineered my code so much that if you give me two x speed up, it's just not worth it. And it's usually true, because there's a lot of effort that goes into engineering and system building, which often sort of you know uh, gives bigger wins than a new algorithmic idea. And so, what is the problem I'm specifically talking about here? <clears throat> it's very simple. So we've talked about various variants of nearest neighbor search or vet vector problems. I'm given a bunch of n non-negative vectors in R to the d, so high dimensional space, and I want all pairs that are similar. And similar, I'll measure by cosine similarity, meaning that the similarity between two vectors u and v is just the cosine of the angle between them, or is the normalized dot product. And one of the problems that comes up in, in recommendation systems is, and it's actually one of the key feature in a, in a recommendation system at Twitter, is you want to find all pairs of people or objects that are similar to each other, and this will be then fed into some pipeline. And this is sort of, you know, it's an offline job. So it's not like your nearest neighbor where you think of it as, you know, you pre-process and then you're getting queries. Here it's more of you have this data, and then you produce all pairs that are similar. And uh, one of the important things we'll use is that common representations are non-negative. And maybe if I didn't, uh, I should specify that again. There are n non-negative vectors in high dimensional space. And so this is the problem that we want to study. <clears throat> so another way of sort of phrasing this is I'm given n non-negative unit vectors in R to the d. So I'll think of these as the columns of this matrix. And I'm given some threshold tau. And I want to find all pairs of columns or vectors u and v such that u dot v is more than tau. The dot product is more than tau. And uh, equivalently, if I'm given a matrix A, I'm looking at the Gramian matrix A transpose A, and I want all entries that are more than tau. So this is the problem, and they're non-negative. So this is what we're going to study. And this was one of those examples where instead of me coming up with a better algorithm and trying to sell it to the applied person, the applied person says, I have no algorithm and no system that works at scale. And specifically, if n and d are about a billion, so that's the number of vectors and the dimension of the space, and the number of non-zeros in the matrix, so this is a sparse matrix. So the number of non-zeros is usually on the average, maybe it's about 100 per column, uh, but there's a lot of skew in the data. The number of non-zeros is about more than 10 billion. Then, uh, at least at Twitter, there was no system solution. Like, essentially, the, yeah? How many of them would be like interesting for you, larger than threshold, roughly? What How many of them would be more than the threshold? Yeah. So on the average, let's say about 10 to 100 per vector. So maybe about the total number of pairs you'll get is uh, maybe 10 billion or 100 billion. Wait, how is it larger than the number of non-zeros? How is it larger than the... Why does it have to do... I mean, it's, it's oh, similar... It's more than 10 billion. It's yeah, like yeah. It can be much more. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It can be much, much more than this. So the output actually is quite large. 
I mean, so, okay, so I, I should say that this is not the phrasing that they chose. They would choose the phrasing that says, which is similar maybe to more of how you would phrase the nearest neighbors, give me the top 10 nearest neighbors for every vertex. Um, but it then becomes like, as, as Rasmus talked about yesterday, it becomes hard to talk about precision and recall in those settings. And with this, it's easier to define precision and recall and sort of also to, to benchmark the algorithm. And uh, so I'll come back to what is the value of tau that is relevant for this problem, because that becomes central to the challenges. And so there was no system solution, meaning that essentially what was used was sort of various hacky algorithms, and it was known that they're not going to converge. And this is, um, this is where you know, it <clears throat> seemed like there was a new algorithmic idea that was required. And so the result we have is, OK, it, it's called WIMP because you know, this was a dub, dub, dub. You have to come up with some stupid acronym to describe your algorithm. So sorry. But <laughs> it's basically a MapReduce algorithm for finding similar vectors. And it has a theoretically near optimal shuffle or communication, which I'll explain. And it's practically viable that it actually worked on this instance with, OK, the reason I put O's there is because I'm not allowed to disclose exactly how many edges or vertices they have, but basically that's how many there are. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it works on you know, um, a matrix which has about 100 billion non-zeros without killing your cluster. So it works in a day, which, which is reasonable. Uh, and um, you know, the way to think about this is 100 billion is about a terabyte, so that you could barely store on a very large machine. But if any intermediate work you do starts blowing up, then you have to distribute the work. And instead of getting into sort of the guts of MapReduce, it's more convenient to just to think of a sort of abstract communication model. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Why can't you just enumerate all the non-zeros in the matrix? This seems very feasible to me. You can enumerate the non-zeros, but the number of pairs, I mean, how do you find which are the ones that are similar? Because you want all dot products that are above a threshold. They're sparse, no? They're sparse, but you know, it's, um, uh, the average degree would be about 100, but it starts varying. There's skew. Okay. And so because of that, like, you, can, you could basically, let's say you find some vector here which has, let's say, 100 to 1,000 non-zeros. I mean, you can't go and look up everything else that in the same, um, in the same row which, which has that neighbor. Does that make sense? You can't store it in the memory or? Um, why don't, so why don't I give you the exact description of the application, then maybe it'll, maybe I'll, uh, it'll be clearer. <coughs> um, I mean, what you're suggesting is that you just solve matrix multiplication exactly. Yeah. And that's too much, actually. Okay. And I'll show you numbers to show that that's too much. Yeah. Um, so, OK, let me give the following somewhat abstract model. So here is my matrix. So these are the vectors that I'm looking at. I'm going to represent this just a bi as a bipartite graph. So um, these are the rows, and these are the columns, right? And so technically, these are indexing the vectors. This is indexing the dimension. And it's important that you know I, we fix this, because I'll be using this later on. So, just that on the right side are the vectors, on the left side are the dimensions. So I'm looking at similarity between any two objects over here. And in effect, um, you know, the, the, whatever, the vector is given just by the neighborhood. And you can think of there's a separate machine that stores the neighborhood here and that stores the neighborhood here. Is the model clear? So, OK, so um, <clears throat> I'm, so I, I'm just thinking of this as the adjacency list of a bipartite graph. And now every machine stores one of those lists. And that's what I should have said. Um, so, right? so essentially, every machine here stores a column. Every machine here stores a row. Okay? Uh, and of course, there could be some weight. There's some weight on this. Um, and it's convenient just for us to think about there being synchronous communication amongst edges. So in every phase, there's some communication along the edges. Uh, and uh, this can be simulated in MapReduce by, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's relatively easy. And the total communication is also the total shuffle cost in MapReduce. So what I want to bound is how much communication there's happening. Also, I will talk about running time, but it's actually much of this computation is communication bound, not exactly CPU bound. So any questions about what the model is? is this, yeah. It's just a non-zero um, you, You're right. It's, um, 
it, 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 it'll be convenient when we describe the algorithm, think about this way. But actually, they can actually communicate with anybody. But it turns out that that is really what is relevant. Yeah, just to simplify what's happening. And again, this isn't really the actual model of computation that's under the hood, but it's, um, it's a good proxy for what's happening in MapReduce. Yeah. Okay? All right, so there's, uh, there's been a lot of previous work. I mean, it's just matrix multiplication. So you, you know, there are exact systems called like BLAS and C-sparse, which are surprisingly good. Um, there's a lot of uh, approximate matrix multiplication result, like, you know, Drinius Kandan Mahoney, uh, work by Sarlosh, so on and so forth. There's a lot of work on LSH, uh, which is relevant to this, because in effect, um, the dot product problem is basically nearest neighbor search when you restrict everything to be on the unit sphere. Uh, and so uh, Alex and Ilya talked about uh, some work uh, yesterday. And one of the specific papers I want to mention is, uh, is Andoni Indik, Larhoven, Rosenstein, and Schmidt, which was effectively solving, you know, coming up with LSH um, new hash functions for this problem. And then there's also a line of work on path sampling, which I'll get into. But the problem is, you know, we were trying to apply these things maybe sort of out of the box and just seeing, you know, is any of this going to work? And the problem ends up being that there's just too much communication. So it's not that the running time is bad. You can maybe afford to distribute all the work, but communication along the edges was too much. And so our main goal here is to try to reduce the communication to solve this problem. Uh, now, before I get into the guts of what actually happened, uh, so there's this uh, quote of Giancarlo Rota, which says, philosophers and psychiatrists should explain why it is that we mathematicians are in the habit of systematically erasing our footsteps. Which is, you read a paper and you have no idea why they got to that. So let me tell you about an erased footstep that's not talked about in the paper. So what's the problem? The problem actually comes up at Twitter where uh, you say that two people are similar if the followers intersect. So me and the minion are similar because in the Twitter graph, which is basically who follows whom, if there is a relatively lo if there's an intersection between us, then that's some sign of similarity. And you can measure similarity by just saying that it's the intersection of the sets divided by some, by some normalization. So cosine similarity is just some normalized intersection. So this is a reasonable measure of similarity. Now, domain studies show that similarities of 0.15 to 0.2 matter, meaning that if 15% of my followers also follow you in Twitter, that's usually some sign that we're similar. Now I'll show you some, some numbers on that. Now, the reason why this becomes relevant, so maybe now does this answer your question as to why you can't enumerate all the set intersections? Because you would basically, if, if you try to solve this exactly, then you would be enumerating every possible path of length two in this graph. And that's too much. Yeah. Um, if you look at a lot of the literature on low dimensional projections and hashing and nearest neighbor, and you, you dig into what they're doing, they're usually trying to detect similarities of more than 0.8. Right, because we're looking at dot products at most one. So 0.8 is similar. And so things like LSH are extremely good for deduplication, where you're looking at near similarity. But in recommendation systems where similarities of 0.1 to 0.3 matter, then the performance degrades significantly when you go there. And to give you an example, I mean, this was a paper in www, so we had to give these examples. If you look at the Twitter handle of www 2016, and you looked at a bunch of other conferences, the similarity score ranges from 0.26 to 0.15. And you can see that they're all similar. And we took a bunch of um, like, you know, network scientists, Duncan Watts, Lad Adamek, Barabasha, Yuri Leskovic, and the similarity between their followers is about 0.2. This is just to say that you know, 0.2 to 0.1 is a reasonable threshold of similarity for things that are obviously semantically similar. And uh, when you dig into the math, you know that to find similarities of tau, you need 1 over tau square work, or pain, or communication, or some such suffering, which is quadratic in tau. And so what happens, a well-engineered solution for tau equals 0 0.9. Where this bound comes from. Sorry? Where this bound 1 over tau square comes from. This is usually if you're doing some sort of low-dimensional projection, okay. then you get a 1 over tau square. You may log in over tau square, but then there's a tau square. Okay. And so a well so and obviously, you know, you take a solution like this, you have to engineer it. And if you engineer it for tau equals 0.9, it fails miserably for tau equals 0.2, because there's that much more pain. And so, in some sense, the real theoretical contribution is we give an algorithm which finds similarities of tau, where the total communication is the following. So, it's, so here's the number of pairs whose similarity is greater than tau. So this is the lower bound on the output. And this is multiplied by tau to the minus 1. 
And then you look at the number of non-zeros in the matrix, and this is multiplied by tau to the minus 2. So there is a tau to the minus 2 pain, but it multiplies a quantity that is somewhat smaller. And if you look at the communication in previous algorithms, the tau to the minus 1 and tau to the minus 2 multiply larger quantities. So this is, this is sort of a cartoon of the main theorem. And the, the hard part was to basically try to get this tau to the minus 1 multiplying the larger quantity in the, in the communication. Okay, any question? Yeah. What is it, lower one, that, that's the output. No, that's exactly what you're looking for. Yeah, that is the output, yeah. So, which is also a lower one on the output. No, um, well, whatever, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's equality and therefore it's also <laughs> less than equal. Yeah, it is the output. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I, I talked about the distributed framework. So how did we actually begin to try to solve this problem? Um, so let me actually tell you about a method called wedge sampling, which was invented by Cohen and Lewis and then rediscovered in four different, three different subsequent works. One of them is, um, it's unfortunately mine. And then, you know, we did this 10 years later and said, oh, these guys actually solved it. And so this was a, a soda paper in, 2000, in 1999. So they have this very neat algorithm that says, okay, you, you're given a matrix A. You're going to do preprocessing, which is linear in A. So number of non-zero time preprocessing. You're going to build a data structure, a randomized data structure. And now you can push a button. So an O of one time, it generates a wedge, which is a path of length 2 in this graph, in this matrix. The guarantee is the probability that i and j are the ends is proportional to the dot product of vi and vj. So it's a sort of important sampler. So in linear time, you build this data structure, and then you push a button, and it will generate a path of length 2 at random. And the endpoints i and j are there proportional to vi dot vj. And uh, yeah. So you're assuming non-negative entries? I'm assuming non-negative entries. Yes, yes, non-negative entries. Uh, and so let me actually tell you how it works. So remember, we represented this uh, matrix as, as this bipartite graph. That's A. Now let me stick A transpose there. So A and A transpose, obviously, uh, you know, the, the rows, of, the columns of A transpose are the rows of A. So these are the dimensions, and these are just indexing the vectors. Now for any edge, I have a weight that's A R I, and the weight of this is, uh, sorry, this is the weight A R I, this is the weight A R J. Now let's say the weight of a path is the product of these weights. And you know, it's sort of the obvious thing that the sum over paths from i to j actually give you the dot product of vi and vj. It gives you that entry in the matrix product. And so what you need to do is simply sample a path proportional to its weight, and the probability of getting i and j will be proportional to the dot product. So this is what you need to do. And as long as you can, so, and the non-negativity is used because I'm saying sample a path proportional to weight, this is not defined if things are negative. And um, so any, any questions about this? So the, the Cohen-Lewis trick, which you know, if you sit and think about it for a while, you know, you'll come up with, is to you preprocess to compute for each vertex in the middle, compute the sum of these weights. So let's just say the weight of R is the sum of these entries. Right? And then you simply sample. OK, so I, um, I fudged over here. So I should have said. WR is actually the square of this quantity. I mean, it's the weight of this times the weight of all of these. So that's like the total weight of the paths of length 2 that go through that vertex. Right, so now you simply sample R proportional to that weight. It should be the, the square of this quantity. And then once you do that, you can then pick a neighbor proportional to its, you know, to its value over here, and you do the same thing over here, and you'll get a path which is proportional to the total weight. Right, so this is, if there are any questions, let me know. If nothing else, I hope you just learned this, because it's a very neat trick. Because in linear time, you preprocess the matrix, and now in constant time, or depending on your model of uh, bits in constant or logarithmic time, you can actually output ij proportional to the dot product. So it's like, OK, this is a great idea. So what you can do, and actually this is what Zadeh and Goyal did later on, is to say, well, you can also do this in a sort of distributed setting. You can set it up in sort of MapReduce or in this distributed setting, where now you look at all the vertices on the right. So again, now I want to think of just this as, instead of thinking of it as a path in the tripartite graph, let me just fold it back so that this is a path of length 2 over here. Sort of the same thing. And so you're generating these paths of length 2. 
So you could think of the green machine here is going to generate a bunch of wedges with the green vertex in the center, the red vertex generates a bunch of these, the, the yellow vertex generates those, and now essentially this was an important sample. You were able to sample ij proportional to the dot product. So if you collect all the wedges that you sampled, you would see the more frequent, the more uh, similar things more often. Right? So you can collect all the parts of length 2 that are generated through all of this, and you say, oh, look, ij appeared here, here, and here. Therefore, ij is probably similar. So, so that's, that's, you know, this is the algorithm of Zadeh and Goel. It's basically just saying you take the Cohen-Lewis trick, and then you do a distributed implementation of it. Now, what you need is a shuffler communication of all the wedges that are generated, because that's how you will collect and figure out who are the ones that are common. So you can say, how many wedges do you need to actually catch you know, vi dot vj is greater than tau? So now let's do the calculation. So I said you know, a wedge with ij is generated proportional to vi dot vj. So let's just figure out what the proportionality constant is. That's just the sum of vi dot vj over all ij, which makes sense, right? That's, that's the that's sort of the ambient space from which you're sampling, yeah? So basically, if I condition on i and j, what's the distribution over r's? Uh, the distribution over r's will then, um, uh, I think. For your application, it doesn't matter. For, right? for our application, it's not going to matter because all of those weights will be the same. But I think in general, but it's going to be. It's uniform. It's like also depends on the it, length. it depends on the length of, yeah. It depends actually probably on the weight of that path because it's generating paths uniformly. It's generating paths proportional to their weight. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so this is the proportionality constant here, and uh, this is just the sum of all dot products or similarities. So, which you know, it really is the um, you know the the one matrix one norm. Well, it's the one norm of all entries in a transpose. A. Right? So that's like the sum of all the dot products. Okay. Any questions? So you know, this is easy to turn around. You say if you want vi dot vj, well, the number of samples you need is basically the reciprocal of that well, times 10 for convergence. For us, convergence is, that's log n, roughly. <laughs> right? So you want large entries. You only want, the problem is you only want the large entries, but you pay something linear in the total sum of dot products. But the nice thing is that you have a 1 over tau dependence. So now the question is, you know, how does this work out? So you know, it's a sort of, if you just think of this as the space of all dot products, here's a large dot product, here's a small one and you're basically throwing darts into this board, obviously you will hit this much more often than you'll hit that, except the problem is there's, there's a lot of noise and there's only a little bit of signal. And so there are lots of small entries that tend to drown out the few large entries, and most of the communication tends to be noise. Again, just to give you some specific numbers, so uh, these are three like benchmark matrices that are out there, where N and D, the dimension, it ranges from millions to billions, so flock is actually the Twitter graph. I'm not allowed, yeah, it's, it's, it's O of 1 billion. So if you look at what is A transpose A, the one norm. So there's actually an algorithm to compute this. Uh, you know, you can compute it. And then you can say your total shuffle for computing tau being 0.2 is, you know, 10 times that for convergence divided by tau 2 times 16 bytes because, you know, every wedge is like a pair of longs and so you have 16 bytes. So you can get some sort of back of the envelope calculation of how much shuffle this algorithm is going to do. And you sort of plug it in, and you get that for the Twitter graph, you need to shuffle 18,000 terabytes. Like just by looking at that's how many, you know. And even for something which is fairly small, you need like 200 to 600 terabytes. A single round of MapReduce on the Twitter cluster would handle about 200 terabytes, just to give you a sense of what's going on. So you can engineer the heck out of, you can try to engineer these and maybe you'll get it done. Say instead of a long, I'll use an int and I'll squeeze some bits over here and divide the work up. But for a graph, for the Twitter graph, this is just way beyond what, what you could engineer. And there's no system solution. So one of the reasons to do this calculation was to tell people like, look, you know, there's no way you're gonna buy another system that's gonna solve the problem. And um, so we were stuck here for, for a long time. Uh, and because, you know, and then we, we did try engineering in various ways until at some point there was, you know, we were sitting down and now you start thinking like a theorist. You say, well, okay, let's, let's suppose there's some oracle. Is there some oracle that could help us solve this problem? And suppose 
there is this magic oracle who could just tell us what the dot product was. If you asked for any ij, give me vi.vj, let's say this oracle would could tell you the answer. Uh, so this is locally generating a bunch of wedges, which then it has to communicate. But the wedge generation for this is local, right? Because it knows its neighborhood. And so for each wedge, it could ask, oh, what is vi.vj? The oracle says, oh, it's more than tau. It says, okay, of course I have to output this. And you could ask for another i prime j prime, you know, what is that? And if the oracle said, no, this is actually less than tau, you say, I don't need to output that. So if you had an oracle that will actually tell you which are the dot products which are large, then you could obviously output that. And then in this case, only the wedges where vi.vj is greater than tau would be communicated. But you know, you could say, but isn't designing the oracle the problem itself? I mean, what's going on here? And it turns out that now, so just to remind you of the, the setting again, you know, this is the bipartite graph that represents a matrix. These are the vectors, these are the dimensions, and the dimensions I've colored. So each I over here, so each machine here knows this vector. Right? This is vector vi dot vj. Um, so here's something that is obvious. If the green node here knew all of these vectors, now the green node here is generating the wedges. If it knew what all these vectors are, it could construct the oracle itself. But of course, that's just exact matrix multiplication. Because if this thing actually knew all these vectors, then you're actually implicitly generating all parts of length 2, which is the matrix product. And so is there some way we can kind of compress these and send it to that so it could just locally build the oracle? And uh, there was sort of an aha moment and said, well, you know, this is where you know, we could try to, to use hashing methods from LSH or something to basically compress these and send that compressed sketch, which then this vertex over here could get those compressed sketches and then build the oracle itself. I'll just show that again because it took a long time for me to get that to work, right? So there, each ver vertex over here, machine over here, generates a compression of the vector and sends that compression over to the left, and then this can then build the oracle. And so the green node would collect all the sketches and then simulate the oracle using them. And so what is the sketch we use? Well, you know, we use Chariker Simhash because we're looking at dot products. So what does Simhash do? Simhash just says, if you have two vectors vi dot vj, if you pick a random vector, then your hash is a one bit hash, which is simply the sign of the dot product. And so in this case, the hash of vi would be one and the hash of vj would be zero. And it's a single bit hash. And the probability that the hash values are the same is one minus theta divided by pi, where theta is the angle between them. And so the hashing scheme is, you know, you basically just rinse and repeat k times to get some kind of sketch. So you do this a bunch of times, and you're going to get some sort of hash. And the Hamming distance between the hashes is some measure of the angle. And you know, just you know, um, just to be a little formal, so the Hamming distance is some binomial where if k is the number of times you repeated this, then it's a binomial you know with with the parameter theta over pi. And so if the vectors are orthogonal, if the vectors are orthogonal, then actually this is a half. Right? So it's just a standard binomial. And you, know, you can kind of do the math, apply the cosines and everything. And so now let's just say, what is the hash length that we need? If you have two vectors that are orthogonal versus two vectors where the cosine similarity is, is, is tau, then the angle between them is roughly like pi over 2 times 1 minus tau. So it's, it's just, and you, know, you just do the Chernoff bound. Roughly, you need 1 over tau square flips to distinguish them. And this is where the tau square pops up. And you know, this, sort of, this is the pain now, because you have to detect orthogonality from sort of near orthogonality. And you need the 1 over tau square, not the 1 over tau. And so this tells us of a hash length of roughly 1 over tau square, you can determine similarities of 1 over tau. And now you kind of plug it all together. Uh, so for each vertex over here, it has to sort of generate these hashes. So technically, you can think of each vertex on the left generates a Gaussian and then would send that Gaussian over here and then this can then compute those dot products. And uh, you know, the thing is you don't, I won't do that again because you, you saw that trick already. But um, so as long as each of these generates a Gaussian, then this, 
um, the machine over here knows the vector and can actually generate the sort of dot product. And you know, I'll spare you some of the details of how you actually, you know, how you do this. Um, but effectively, the way it works is each processor on the right computes this hash, and uh, this, if you use you know zero random generators, this just requires number of non-zeros communication. So it's quite cheap. So you generate all of these hashes. Then each vertex on the left will collect all the hashes from its neighbors, and the communication here is the number of non-zeros. So every edge is sending a hash of length log n over tau squared. So all the hashes are collected. And then finally, each of these runs the sort of the Cohen-Lewis trick. It generates a bunch of wedges. So every time it generates a wedge, it can look up the hashes to get some estimate of what the dot product is. And then you know, based on what the estimate is, it can either ignore it or output it. So the nice thing is that anything that is output after this is, is a genuine, is actually similar. So any, any questions on that? Yeah. Did you try instead of like uh, in independent Gaussian vectors generate like random orthogonal matrix? I think it usually works quite a bit better. Oh, that's an interesting, no, we actually didn't try that. But um, maybe it doesn't matter for you too much, but you can actually like make hashes quite a bit shorter. Ah, it's interesting. So actually in this case, um, what we do is, we don't, you know, so actually none of these actually sends a Gaussian because this already knows what its neighbor is. So it, if it uses a pseudo random generator using that as a seed, it sure, can just but do it a. But it's not about. Uh, oh, I see. It's about. It's about just making hashes shorter. But okay. I, can, making the. We can discuss also. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be that would be interesting. Um, uh, so the number of communica uh, number of communication. The final step is actually. The only thing that is output is actually a pair that is similar, but there's an extra tau inverse log n because the same pair could be generated multiple times. And so if you go through the math, you see that it's actually, there's some repetition there, which is necessary. Yeah? yeah. Okay, can you explain that? <coughs> what sort of, uh, do you use this sim hash for bucketing or do you use it for sketching? Uh, We're using it for sketching. Okay, so, so there's no bucketing that's happening here. Okay. It's using, so once this vertex here has the sim hashes of all of these, it, it, it's, it can sort of build this oracle itself. For any two, vert, any two uh, I, for any i and j, it can determine whether vi dot vj is above a threshold. Okay, so, so, so the benefit is, is instead of sending, sending the, the, the whole, like the original data, you set these shorter? You, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. So yeah, that, that, that's all. So in the end, you know, it's not that fancy. You basically plug in Cohen Lewis, and you plug in this thing, and you stitch it together, okay. and then you, yeah. But, but couldn't you just use some 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 bucketing first? And so bucket, I mean, so we had tried that, but then there the problem with it. What, so actually, David and I were discussing this. Uh, in some naive ways, if you do the bucketing, then looking at all pairs in the bucket is too much. And then if you want to do sort of vanilla LSH, the problem is you need technically super linear sort of space totally. And then that communication will then kill you. So the thing is, the simhash sketches here are sh not large enough to do bucketing. They're much shorter than that. Because they're only of length log n over tau square. Like typically you would need something like n to the row to be able to do the bucketing. Oh, I could be, I hope I'm not misspeaking. Yeah? What is the tau log n factor then? This is basically, um, so, uh, to make sure that you get convergence, you have to generate more wedges than exactly what is required. Log n over tau? It's, it's log n over tau. It's a tau, tau inverse, sorry. It's log n over tau. Yeah, there's a typo. So, you know, there's some work that's required. Uh, maybe the important things to mention are, we, you know, you can state a sort of precision recall type result, saying that if anything is, if we output something, then it's significant. If something is significant, then it will be output. And uh, there's something with the communication costs and the hashes. So I'll sort of skip all of this. Um, and uh, maybe I'll show you, uh, there's one caveat that, that's there, which is, um, so on the right, on the left side, we actually remove all vertices which have extremely high degree. Because it turns out in the application, those are spammers. Those are people who follow everybody. And um, this actually, in effect, is removing dimensions that participate in too many vectors. It reduces the skew in communication, so it actually helps us. And may I'll so maybe come back to this in a couple of minutes. Sorry. So 
Um, the important thing to note is that, um, well, you know, in the experiments, uh, this is sort of the estimated shuffle cost if you just try to shuffle all the wedges, and this is what we get. So something as 18,000 terabytes comes to 200 terabytes or 300 terabytes, which is reasonable. Uh, I think an interesting plot over here is just to see what all the what is the the ratio of the various things. So so this is think of this as the total communication, and the red part is just the sketches. That's the hashes that are being sent, and the green part are the actual candidates that are output. Like you, you know, for every wedge you check locally whether it's above a threshold and you send it. And then of course there are certain IJs which are repeated, so you compress that to get the output. So the output is actually about 10% about of the total communication. So clearly there's a lot of extra stuff that's happening. And any savings over here would be useful. And so maybe you know, what you were suggesting about compressing the hashes would be useful there. Was it easy to work with engineers convincing them to use random randomness? So, uh, you know, Anish is good at that. Like, he... <laughs> so... <laughs> like, in my experience, that's a huge... It, it, yeah, but uh, th th this was so large a problem that they, they kind of accepted. They accepted the curse of randomness. Um, but that, that was all Anish and not... not yeah. And so... So let me just sort of uh, tell you about some of the, the open problems that are still left over here. Uh, actually, many of them. One is exactly what I said, that if you look at the communication that a specific node gets, it gets all the hashes of its neighbors. And uh, so it's order of d times tau inverse log n, where, or tau, tau to the minus 2, I'm sorry, where d is actually its degree. Now, we actually remove the high degree vertices because in that application we could, but in general you cannot. And there are certain other applications where the degrees are actually very large, in which case what this does, even though total communication is low, the maximum communication at a particular node is high enough to kill the problem. And uh, it would be nice to have an alternate scheme that can actually bound the maximum communication. Like something where maybe D could even be something like, let's say, O of N, or something that is just barely little O of N, and yet can we still get the communication to be smaller? Um, the other thing, and I guess to some extent this is what Ilya was talking about, is you know, our sketch was actually one kilobyte. So it's 8,000 bits. That's 8,000 sim hash runs. And it barely distinguishes you know, something that's orthogonal from a dot product of 0.1. And better sketches would be very useful. Like Even if you could save some constant factor with a clever sketch, that would reduce this significantly. Or we could use the same sketch to detect things that are you know, even, you know, we, could, we could improve that threshold. And that would be very useful. Uh, maybe from a more theoretical standpoint, um, the uses of non-negativity were interesting because I think any sort of anything that's based on that is rotation invariant is not using negativity. So the fact that the Cohen-Lewis trick actually uses the representation is interesting. Uh, it, you know, Ilya and, uh, and Alex have done things with data-dependent hashing, but there it's more of using low-dimensional structure, and it would be nice if there's some principal way of using the non-negativity. Uh, and you know, in general, you know, what is the complexity of this problem? I don't know. Maybe people have already. I, I, I haven't dug enough into the literature, but uh, if you want to find all large entries, maybe just in a transpose, where a is non-negative. Is there some well good understanding of the complexity? It smells like some fine grain complexity problem. So yeah. Sorry. Just as an example, your data. So it's, it's positive and it's sparse, but yes. still floating point. Um, in this case, actually, uh, they were f they were floats because you normalized. Yeah, but they were originally like originally. It's a it's a binary matrix. It's a graph, but then you binary. yeah, it's binary, zero but one. then you normalize it. Sorry, zero one. it's zero one. Yeah, zero one entries. Yeah, because you take a graph and then you're looking at it's actually set intersection, but you're normalizing it, so that's what creates the floats. But then it turns out we don't even use the binary part of it. Yeah, yeah, which is also interesting. So I'm I'm out of time. And uh, so I will just end with uh, the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> All right, so thank you. <laughs> we have time for one or two questions. Yeah. Right. So I mean, you you like trying to focus on, on what could work in practice, which is very nice. I mean, but like uh, what I mean is, uh, I'm thinking like the different direction of like exploiting mm -hmm. the fact you're really trying to solve it in practice and not the right. worst case. Suppose uh, this network of people, uh, this network, uh, was actually like highly, uh, easily clustered into mm -hmm. say a hundred mm -hmm. pieces. 
probably easy in some way. Then you could potentially like solve the problem like you know one hundred one of the hundred times. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a very interesting like, thought. So we had, you know, we were toying with whether, so maybe a different way of phrasing that is it might be too expensive to cluster the original data, but it could be that the, that implies that the similarity has enough structure that yeah, you could exactly. exploit so that in the algorithm if, itself. If you have a solution mm -hmm. that kind of like naturally adapts to that, so yeah. you have like the worst case bound that you mentioned, right. but somehow in practice it would leverage the fact that if it's clusterable or something, it actually use Less like you know, like uh, instance. Well, not you know, instance of that. Yes. Yeah, so, so actually, um, one of the things that we had observed, I mean, we is that it's reasonably often that if you know, if I'm similar to somebody and that person is similar to someone else, then we, we are also similar. And so, what could be the case is you could set tau to be fairly large, just get some candidates, and then just explore amongst that to find the other candidates. Uh, but I think it would be really nice to actually even theoretically formalize that and like and try to analyze that. So exploiting sort of some sort of transitive structure in the in the nearest neighbor graph or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So I, I was wondering, did you did you consider kind of communication complexity lower bound for this these kind of problems? I mean, no, not yet. No, I, and I, uh, I, yeah, I, I haven't. Um, I think there would be some interesting things to be proven here. Um, one thing is, you know, is this Cohen-Lewis trick somehow optimal in some way? Um, in that, you know, it basically you get this important sampler for the entries. Can you can you actually sample large entries even better? Using linear time preprocessing. I don't know if that's a well posed question, but something like that. Okay, yeah. Well, thanks again.